The following video is intended for mature audiences. It contains horror elements, adult themes, and language that might not be suitable for younger viewers. The Children of November. My workspace was a mess of missing student files, each one a record of another unexplained absence from Harmony Elementary. In just two weeks, nine children had disappeared without a trace, all from my fifth grade class. The local police were now a constant presence in our school, repeatedly asking the same questions and promising increased security measures. Meanwhile, strange frost patterns appeared on my classroom windows with an eerie message. Join us, Miss Parker, teach us forever. Three days before the first child went missing, I found an old diary in the school's basement storage. It belonged to a Miss Collingswood, who taught fifth grade at Harmony back in 1873. Her diary revealed an unhealthy obsession with her students that led to her dismissal. The day after she was fired, her entire class vanished without a trace. She was later discovered dead among their abandoned shoes, which were filled with ice crystals. Every 50 years since that horrifying event, another fifth grade class has disappeared without leaving any evidence for the police or federal investigators to follow up on. The townsfolk always come up with new theories, serial killers, mass runaways, anything but what Miss Collingswood wrote in her diary using her own blood. I found a way to preserve your innocence forever at a heavy cost. Eternal love demands eternal sacrifice. The first student to disappear this time was Marcus Jones, followed by Katie Reynolds and then Merritt Blackwood. One by one, they vanished until my classroom was nearly empty. Strange drawings started appearing in my classroom overnight, showing me surrounded by my students while frost swirled around us. Overwhelmed by desperation and curiosity, I began spending nights at the school hoping for answers. In my dreams, I heard their young voices singing lullabies that sounded ancient and frightening. Join us, they urged me. We need a teacher. Miss Collingswood believes you're ready. One night I saw Katie outside my window. Her skin glowed like moonlight on fresh snow, and her eyes seemed to hold an eternity of winters. I returned to the basement where Miss Collingswood's diary was open on a table, revealing a blood pact for eternal youth for both teacher and students. Every 50 years, a new teacher was needed to maintain the spell. The basement door opened to reveal Miss Collingswood looking young as ever, with my missing students following behind her. They were wearing the same clothes they had vanished in, and each one moved with an eerie grace. Miss Collingswood explained why she chose me. It was my destiny to protect these children from the harsh realities of life and offer them immortality. The sounds of distraught parents and police sirens filled the space outside, However, they were searching in vain. My students now existed in another realm, where learning never ended and academic success was measured by frost markings. I was supposed to sign my name in blood on the last page of Miss Collingswood's diary. This would bind me to 28 souls who would never age or leave or stop learning. It meant trading my mortality for an endless classroom. Miss Collingswood reached out her hand toward me, ice crystals spinning on her palm. Your lesson plan today is immortality. And so, I signed. My skin began to glow like moonlight reflecting off snow, and somewhere else in harmony, another teacher looked over reports of missing children and felt an unexplainable longing. The cycle would continue. We exist outside of time, my eternal students and I, teaching and learning in a perpetual winter twilight. If you hear children's voices singing through the fog on cold nights, don't follow unless you're ready to give up your life for endless education. But if you're a teacher who understands that some students are too precious to let go, we could always use more teachers. After all, every 50 years we need new blood, and winter is coming again. Reflection. The eerie sound of my daughter's laughter echoed through the empty hallways at midnight. It was a chilling melody, unlike her usual cheerful giggle. This sound had a sinister undertone, as if it were an orchestra playing out of tune. 
I found her in the basement, sitting cross-legged and absorbed in a game of pat-a-cake with her reflection in a mirror that wasn't supposed to be there. After my wife left us, I became Lucy's sole guardian. We moved into an old Victorian house on Maple Street hoping for a fresh start. Things were going well, until Lucy found an odd mirror, with a black frame covered in symbols that seemed to shift when looked at directly. When Lucy touched the mirror, its surface rippled like disturbed water. Her reflection lagged behind by several seconds, smiling when she frowned and reaching out when she pulled away her hand. Behind her image I saw glimpses of strange rooms with distorted corners and shadows that moved unnaturally. She lives inside, Lucy said softly while tapping the glass. Her father took her there years ago, and she's been waiting ever since. She says it's one of seven portals. Three days later, Detective Arrow informed me about missing children. Anthony Tran, who was eight, Emily Torres, who was seven, Lily Arrow, his own daughter, only six years old. Each child had disappeared, leaving behind shards from broken mirrors. Lucy stopped sleeping after hearing this news. She spent nights talking to her reflection while dark circles formed under her eyes. Not yet, she would whisper into the night air filled with the smell of damp earth from our cellar floor. He must understand first. I reached out to previous residents of our house and learned their daughter had also vanished mysteriously back in 1986, a victim claimed by another mirror just like ours. City archives revealed similar disappearances dating back to 1943 when Professor Gerald Pierce lost his daughter Isabel due to his obsession with mirrors and his mad theories about interdimensional portals. Pierce's diary was found among old library records. He had crafted seven mirrors in a desperate attempt to find Isabel, creating pathways between reflections. The symbols were supposed to act as a containment circle, his failed effort to trap the entity he had summoned, but the entity twisted his creation, turning each mirror into a dangerous portal. I tried destroying our mirror but failed. Hammers bounced off its surface with a loud clang. Flames wouldn't touch it. They danced around it like tormented spirits. Holy water sizzled and evaporated before even reaching it. Lucy screamed until I stopped my attempts, warning that they would target other children instead. Each night, the cellar turned freezing cold within minutes. Lucy spent hours staring at the glass while her reflection gripped her wrist from the other side and additional reflections gathered behind it, small faces with vacant eyes reaching out toward our world. In 1944, authorities discovered Professor Pierce's body half buried in a mirror's surface. His journal's last entry described Isabel dancing with shadowy children in reversed rooms, inviting him to join their eternal game. Tonight, the mirror's surface parted like curtains revealing countless chambers lit by an unnatural light. Tiny bones scattered across floors that twisted upwards onto walls, while children's voices reciting nursery rhymes in reverse echoed through the air. Lucy's reflection revealed an unusually large number of teeth as it held my daughter captive by her wrist, while other reflections merged, their faces blending into one another. Daddy, said Lucy, her voice echoing with those of countless lost children over generations. She showed me where they all end up. No more loneliness or division. The mirrors want us together. Isabel Pierce spun through the glass. Her figure flickered between child and shadow as she sang, Seven portals, seven bloodlines. The circle waits to be completed. The mirror's surface flowed like liquid silver as Lucy stepped halfway through, her existence split between both dimensions. It was her turn to join the reflection. The Paper Children on a brisk October Tuesday, Miss Evans presented her third grade class with an art project. Illustrate your dream family, she instructed, her tone juxtaposed against the dusty scent of the classroom. As the week progressed, a troubling pattern of events began to unfold. Parents started dying in manners that chillingly mirrored their children's drawings. I was tasked by Metro Police to probe these cases. Abel Logan sketched his father flying high in the sky. Later, John Logan was discovered lifeless on the concrete beneath his office high-rise. Emily Robbins portrayed her mother with angelic wings. That same evening, Jessica Robbins' vehicle plunged off the highway. Their creations were showcased in the school hallway. 
families rendered in crayon peering out from their paper existence. Principal Davidson shared Miss Evans' employment record with me. Three distinct schools over a decade, each tenure ending following a string of unexplained fatalities. The parents had perished in manners reflecting their children's illustrations. My own child Rose was one of Miss Evans' pupils. She illustrated us together with stars encircling my figure. Over supper one night she mentioned offhandedly, you'll be joining them soon. She clarified that Miss Evans believes art possesses its own vitality. I delved deeper into Miss Evans' past. She was born into this world as Gretchen Rhodes in 1967 to a Professor Arnold Rhodes. Historical newspapers conveyed that her family perished in a fire when she was just six years old. All that endured was a juvenile sketch of her family ablaze. Detective Green and I covertly entered her residence one night. The cellar walls were plastered with countless children's drawings, hundreds of familial portraits spanning decades, each paired with photographs, parents eternally captured as envisioned by their offspring's imagination. At the heart of this unsettling collection hung Miss Evans' original work, a small girl witnessing her family incinerate. As I observed the page, the flames seemed to flicker and sway as if they were alive and the child's smile grew wider as I studied it. Children are receptive. Miss Evans's voice startled me from behind, its gentleness in stark contrast to the terror I was experiencing. Art communicates. Colors resonate. Reality yearns to mimic art. As Green instinctively reached for his weapon, a drawer filled with student artwork suddenly exploded, sending paper figures flying through the air like twisted confetti. The sharp edges of construction paper cut through the room like blades, and crayon strokes burned like branding irons. In a split second, a red line appeared across Green's neck, silencing his shouts in an instant. Rose's latest drawing fluttered down amidst the turmoil, our family depicted in a circle, stars spiraling around my figure. The colors seemed to extend toward me. The drawings have life. Miss Evans's voice was barely discernible above the pandemonium her skin appearing flat and lifeless, almost two-dimensional. Children possess such potent imaginations, they grasp how delicate reality is. My arm went numb and the feeling left my fingers. My daughter, Rose, was huddled in a corner, feverishly adding more stars with her red crayon onto her sketch. Sketch swiftly, my darling, Miss Evans spurred Rose on with a sickly sweet voice. Make Daddy splendid, everlasting. I felt my very essence warping, twisting, merging with the grotesque images that circled us like ravenous beasts, closing in on their next meal, starved for depth and form. Color me eternal. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. See you next time. Thank you for watching.